welcome to this session, the sustainable commercializ commercialization of a space, the case uh, for a voluntary code of conduct for the space industry. Um, I remember to you, if you have questions for our uh, presenter, please type them in the chat box and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, so it is an honor uh, now to introduce uh, Dr. Margarita Shirsaki. Uh, she is a communication policy and project officer at NEREUS. That's the network of European regions using space technologies focusing on the regional space policy by promoting the use and uptake of space data towards European regions and European decision makers. Uh, she is a space policy expert and she holds an advanced master of space studies from KU Leuven. And in 2020, her article on the sustainable commercialization of space, the case of a voluntary code of conduct for the space industry was published in Space Policy, an international journal on the volume 52. Uh, finally, during 2002, uh, 2023, she also served as mentor for uh, of Space for Women, an initiative of the UN Space uh, Agency. So yeah, welcome and the uh, space is all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for this warm welcome. And um, also, I would like to thank uh, the participants who joined uh, the session. I will shortly um, uh, share my presentation. Uh, I think it's better uh, to guide uh, to guide you through my um, uh, through through my presentation. So let me know if you can see everything. I think uh, yes, it it's looks fine. perfect. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so, as Mauricio said, I would be happy to present to you uh, my paper. Um, in the next few minutes, uh, I will um, present to you why, as you can see in the first slide, why there is a need for a voluntary code of conduct to ensure the sustainability of space activities why a company, a space company, would be interested in developing such a code. And finally, my proposed code of contact. And of course, if you have any questions, you can uh, write them in the chat or send me an email later on. Um, uh, going to the second slide, I believe that everyone agrees that the private space sector has seen significant expansion and innovation. Um, you are all aware uh, that uh, the space industry has a long history, it's not now, but uh, since the 60s, 60s and 70s, uh, we saw the government funded space race. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, the early private ventures, and uh, now we are in a new era of space commercialization. Uh, the early 2010s marked the beginning of a transformative trend with new space companies and startups entering the market. Uh, I unfortunately I didn't manage to follow the conference since the beginning, but I'm sure you have heard this information uh, before. What I would like to highlight in this slide is that uh, according to OECD, uh, the space economy generated 400 billion in revenue in 2023. So is that significant? And to better understand space economy, I think there was a speaker before me uh, talking about space economy. Uh, OECD gives also a definition on the space economy. They divide uh, space economy into three categories. Uh, the upstream sector, so activities related to launching R&D, um, and so on, downstream activities, the development of Earth observation services and products, and thirdly, activities related to technology transfers from space to other sectors. You can ask me if you have uh, questions on that. According to another report, uh, the sector is projected to grow over 1 trillion by 2040. And in terms of investing, this is something that uh, we would be uh, very interesting to see afterwards. In terms of investing, 
uh, space reached 12.5 billion in 2023, uh, and notable increase from uh, 2022. All this growth, of course, is reasonable uh, if we consider the multiple benefits of space activities for societies and humanities. We don't get busy with space for, for nothing. There is a reason behind that. But for the purpose of the article, um, and due to the limited timing, uh, I will not uh, elaborate on that. Um, I would uh, prefer to focus mainly on the challenges regarding sustainability, the challenges deriving from space uh, industry. But I would be happy also to take any questions regarding benefits of, the, of space activities. So coming back to challenges, there are many, but for the purpose of the presentation, I identified uh, three. Um, and you can see them also uh, in the slide. Uh, the first one, it's a very, uh, pop very popular challenge. It's the rise of space debris. Uh, according to ESA, the European Space Agency, the number of uh, objects in 2023 is much higher. We are talking about um, millions of uh, small debris orbiting the Earth. They give a detailed information uh, about uh, and numbers about this debris. Um, and of course, the presence of satellite mega constellations uh, further increase the risk of collisions with space infrastructure, such as the International Space Station or another satellite. Um, according to ESA, the European Space Agency, despite improved mitigation efforts, uh, space debris, the space debris population uh, continued to grow in 2023. Uh, this is one challenge. Another challenge has to do with environment, environmental impact of space, commercial space activities on Earth, which is becoming more ap ap uh, apparent. Uh, a recent study uh, found that increased pollution from re-entering satellites and debris poses risk to Earth, uh, to the Earth's ozone layer. Moreover, airborne aluminum oxide from satellite re-entries has increased eightfold between 2016 and 2022 with potential harmful, uh, harmful effects on the atmosphere. And another study highlighted that the potential effects of various rocket emissions uh, on atmosphere and climate uh, change have become uh, more evident. Um, I'm not a physicist or, a, or a, an engineer, but these are reports written by, by these people, and I would be happy to give you the literature later on. In terms of science exploration, we all might have heard that the constellation of satellites coming from the biggest private uh, satellite provider is inter interfering with astronomical observations. So astronomers, astronomers cannot uh, implement um, their observations uh, in the skies as they did uh, in the past. They, they have difficulties uh, due to the strong lightning coming from the constellations. Uh, of course, the list is unlimited, um, but I would like to mention one more, and this is linked with the democratization of space. Democ the democratization of space uh, is a um, fact, and it's something very positive. I use the definition from um, the RAND Corporation report, uh, highlighting that um, the democratization of space is a movement uh, opening the cosmos to developing countries, startups, universities, and smaller uh, entities. Um, however, the argument can be made through that in many ways, it also consolidates inequalities uh, in the space industry. Uh, if we think that over six, the 62% of uh, active satellites in low Earth orbit belongs to one company owned by one person, uh, it's uh, for sure we think we can think that it's um, not that sustainable and not that um, uh, democratic. So coming to the next slide, um, a question that you might uh, think is, uh, okay, there are these challenges and there are even more, I'm sure about it. Um, so you can think what, what, what the legal regime is doing about it. Um, can the current space legal order ensure the sustainability of space 
commercial space activities in view of these challenges. In my paper, I examine um, the current uh, legal framework governing space activities in detail. However, due to the limited timing, uh, I will just comment on the fact that the Outer Space Treaty was designed um, for state actors. State actors uh, are liable for the actions uh, of the industry. Um, as it is reflected in Article uh, 4, meaning that private space activities need to be authorized and supervised by the appropriate uh, state. Um, I will not dive into other legal or uh, soft law instruments. Uh, I try in my paper to examine each one of them. Um, hi, later on, you can ask me, of course, if you have a more uh, specific uh, questions. Um, what I would like to, to focus now is that um, a complementary solution to this kind of challenges, uh, what can help space industry uh, become more sustainable? What could be a complementary solution to the existing legal framework? Uh, so thinking what could be this complementary tool um, I came across a very interesting example, the example of FANG. FANG is the um, a group of technology companies. The abbreviation stands for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Alphabet. And the recurrent problems these companies have with uh, regulatory authorities in different countries, or even international organizations such as uh, the European Union, if you remember the issue with the personal data and privacy. Uh, either because uh, national or international re legislation has not advanced at, this, at the same speed as the development of these global companies or new legislation is being put in place. Um, and as a, as, a consequences, as a consequence, it put pressure on these companies to act in a more responsible way. And what we notice there is that, and it's a common characteristic across all these companies, is that they pledge to follow a given code of conduct that would form a fundamental element in their relations with customers, investors, and the public. And this brings us to the fact that the codes of conduct is a as a form of self-regulation has extended uh, its remits to become the basis for relations with the public. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Code of Conduct, it's something very simple, don't, don't be afraid about it. It's a set of rules, guidelines, standards, or ethics uh, of, a, of an industry, of a company, or even of an individual. Um, for the space industry, my proposed um, a draft a Code of Conduct can help companies align with sustainability goals, reduce legal and regulatory risks, and foster a positive corporate culture. Uh, it's, I'm talking more about the internal process of, uh, of companies. The code of contact is more about the internal process of a company and how this company can adopt a, sust a sustainable behavior and sustainable practices, but in from its inside, from its internal dynamics. Um, Okay, so uh, coming to uh, the code of contact and checking the time as well. Um, I will outline here the main characteristics of this code of contact. Uh, in my article, you will find everything in detail. Um, firstly, the code outlines uh, four key principles. You can see that in, the next, in this slide. Um, it's precaution, protection, respect, and accountability. Um, I will focus on accountability principle, on the accountability principle. It's about holding companies responsible for their actions, liable, as we said before, ensuring transparency with regulators and industrial bodies to protect present and future uh, generations. Additionally, uh, the code of conduct includes a set of operational principles, more, a bit more, more practical principles. These are risk assessment, 
So evaluating the risks throughout the project life cycle, uh, minimizing impact and providing a remedy. So establishing uh, contingency plans to address and remedy unforeseen uh, for, an, for an unforeseen uh, environmental damage. Uh, these principles and the whole code of conduct was, was inspired by two, di two different sectors, uh, the banking sector and the humanitarian sector. And for those in the audience who have a, an experience in those sectors, you can recognize uh, some terms uh, that they belong to these uh, to this, um, uh, two sectors. Uh, the reason I did that is because I wanted to my, the code of conduct to be very operational, but on the other hand, very humanitarian to perform under the, um, the key principle of do not harm, which is the, the principle for the humanitarian uh, sector. Now, of course, to, these are just principles, but... Um, uh, to ensure those principles, the code of contact includes uh, also a robust compliance mechanism, and um, I have divided into uh, have divided the mechanism into two uh, parts: the internal control environment, uh, and there uh, uh, we are talking about compliance factions. So, appointing a compliance officer and conducting regular audits. Of course, under the strong leadership of, of an ethical CEO uh, and external control environment, um, this is very rich. Uh, a company can uh, adhere to minimum standards such as ISO uh, guidelines, which are um, uh, very popular, especially in the space sector, uh, and uh, through a contact uh, group. Um, I will move to the... Uh, last slide uh, to the final slide um, and of course you can ask me if you have uh, more questions from the previous slide um, developing the code of co conduct was something very pleasant um, however the most difficult part of my research is to it was to answer to the question why should a space company be interested in adopting a code of conduct uh, why add more effort and restrictions uh, to their activities what is the motivation for a company to develop such a conduct, such a code of conduct? Um, and then uh, I went back to the definition of sustainability. I really like the definition given by the Secure World Foundation uh, and the United Nations General Assembly in 1987. So both of them more or less they say that sustainability or, or space sustainability is um, uh, the practice to ensure that all humanity can continue uh, to use outer space for uh, peaceful purposes and for the socioeconomic benefit now and in the long term. Um, and uh, also an idea of technological, economic and social uh, development uh, that enhances the quality of life without compromising future generations' well-being. So based on, on these definitions, um, I start researching, um, looking for uh, compel compelling reasons for a space company to adopt uh, a sustainability-focused uh, code of contact. I found four, there are more, but I will focus on the most uh, important here, as you can see on the slide. Um, the first one is the alignment with the fourth industrial revolution objectives. Uh, the 4IR um, aims to improve living conditions through technological innovation. Uh, the World Economic Forum gives a very nice, a very concrete definition and description of what uh, the fourth industrial revo revolution is. They say that, okay, it's about technological innovation, it's AI, artificial intelligence, but at the same time, it raises ethical questions about the kind of world we want to live in. So you see this tremendous uh, technological innovation, but at the same time, you have to be ethical on how to use this uh, kind of um, a technology. Space sector is a prominent sector uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. Space is by nature um, a, a innovative um, and future-oriented sector. 
Uh, therefore, a code of contact uh, can support the goals of the fourth industrial revolution by ensuring that space activities contribute positively uh, to societal, not, not just to technological, but also to societal advancement. Uh, and the second reason, the second reason is the um, the response the response to outdated uh, space treaties, um, but also the alignment uh, with recent initiatives such as the UN Corpus guidelines, uh, Confers practices, um, UK's government measures, um, even the Green Deal agenda by the European Commission. All these. Uh, organizations promote sustainable uh, practices and reflect the spirit of sustainability. Um, therefore, a code of contact can help companies align with these evolving standards. Then the rise of ethical investing, I can talk for hours for the, for the ethical investing. New generations starting from millennials, they look more and more into this environmental, social, and government and governance uh, standards. Uh, they want to know where they put their money and uh, um, uh, if a company is ethically and uh, sustainable. And of course, a code of contact uh, can ensure that uh, ethic, can, can ensure investors about the long-term um, presence of a company. Um, then uh, coming to the last, uh, to, the, to the final uh, reason, but uh, yeah, for this presentation, public awareness and branding uh, management, uh, giving the increasing publicity of private space sector activities, the public opinion seems to be one of the most crucial indicators in shaping uh, a company's uh, profile and reputation. I quote here the words of uh, Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, who said, I don't want to go down in history as the guy who put the most amount of space junk in orbit. Um, so uh, last comment, for, yeah, comment from my side is that uh, in the same way, it is likely to expect that the public opinion that is currently deeply concerned with ocean pollution from plastic will hold similar concerns in the future um, on the negative aspects of space commercialization, such as space debris. Um, and concluding, um, I would like to highlight, I don't remember if I did it in the beginning, but um, the, the discussion on my paper is not a debate on self-regulation versus the legal regime, the laws, but more highlighting uh, how self-regulation can be complementary and can effect, effectively ensure the sustainability, uh, sustainability in the space uh, industry. Uh, a voluntary code of contact is a non-legislative governance tool promoting sustainable development in space activities uh, and uh, most importantly it allows the industry to demonstrate its commitment to responsible behavior and set a standard for other companies and um, uh, private entities to follow um, and um, this is uh, the end of the presentation uh, i would be happy to take any questions and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Margarita. This has been a great presentation. So yeah, we have uh, six more minutes yet to accept your comments, questions, whatever you want to uh, share in the chat. So please, we are waiting for you. <laughs> Okay, I was good in time management. Not, I mean, <laughs> my yeah, aim totally. Leave, Thank you for that. Yeah. My aim was to leave ten minutes for people, but okay, six. <laughs> I so, can always reply in, uh, via an email because maybe it's too much to digest. I think people first can digest, uh, and then always I'm available. Uh, I have the my email is on on your website, and they can write the questions at any time, and they can send it to me. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, maybe I would like to ask, uh, as I understood, you have been working in the frame of the European Union. 
uh what's your your vision uh globally so what what are the perspectives in other parts of the world world are you trying to analyze that the relation between european union and other uh, markets like us or yeah asia uh you mean the europe if if uh the european union if they want to Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. I just saw the comment. Um, you mean if the European Union would like to explore other concepts, if I understand correctly? Yes. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm not working in the. I'm not working the institution as such. Uh, the the European Commission or any other uh, um, or in the or any uh, any other EU institution. <laughs> Uh, I, I work for a European uh, association, uh, it's a regional network representing the interests of uh, regions using space technologies. Uh, so from my point of view, um, and as a researcher, maybe I would, uh, I would better say as a researcher, um, There are uh, Europe implements uh, many projects that they they have to do with the international internationalization of European space companies, and um, I can quote uh, some of them. Uh, they're also on the website of of my organization. Uh, so there is a, pe a tendency, and of course, aside of this, they, ha they have also agreements with other states um but i'm not uh, the 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 ex the main expert on on that uh maybe if you have a more concrete uh, qu question i can from a specific institution i can uh no no that's perfect thank you so much i i was just wondering if they like in internationally they share the values that you were uh, talking about yeah if it's But easy to values, create links yes yeah. these principles values it's not just about the european companies it's for uh all companies um Uh, this is something, and maybe this is nice to say, this is something nice to say that this code of contact, I have, I have given a certain structure with principles, operating principles and a compliance mechanism. But uh, a space company, um, space companies uh, differ between them. A space company can be larger. Another one is shorter. And a space company belongs uh, to one space company belongs to the upstream sector, another one to the downstream sector. So this code of contact can be adapted. It's a it's a flexible code of contact can be adapted to the needs of its company and depending also where this company is located, as you said, um, Europe, US, uh, Thailand, um, Africa. Uh, this varies, but uh, I think this is a very good point, actually. I think that um, uh, the code of contact, this code of contact, it's very international because it's based on the humanitarian principles and huma humanitarian uh, principles are global. Uh, everybody should respect, everybody should be accountable. Um, So this this should be something acceptable by every by every company by every private entity, um, and European Union. I mean, uh, not about my code of conduct, but the European Union and the European Commission, especially with the Green Deal agenda, um, they emphasize and they highlight the sustainable element of uh, of operations of any operation not just for the for the space industry if you want to apply to a call to the to a european call for funding you have to be sustainable you have to accept the ethics you have to so the world is is evolving uh, and um, you cannot um, do whatever you want you cannot send a, a motorcycle to to space because you want to show that you are cool you have to you have to have boundaries 
I hope I, I I replied to the to the question. Yeah, 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 totally. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Yes. So thanks to everyone for attending the session, and thank you again, Margarita, uh, for your wonderful presentation. It's my presentation. pleasure, and thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it, and thanks to your uh, congratulations to your work. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So now we, it's a good time to take a short break uh, as the next session will begin in 10 minutes. Uh, we invite you to join uh, the next uh, block of presentations. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And see you around. <laughs>